Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Leadnap Gaming. Today we're taking a look at the X-56 HOTAS for DCS World and Star Citizen. This is the Logitech X-56 HOTAS, and while I normally disconnect everything and film it for these sorts of things, as you can see, it's still connected to my desk. That's important because I'm going to tell you right now that I really don't like this HOTAS, and I can't wait to change it out. Now before you say, well, that's that, sure, I don't like the X-56, but it is mounted to my desk still. There's a reason for that, and even though I say I don't like it, there are reasons you should consider purchasing one. Let's start out by taking a look at the actual hardware. This is the stick, and this was one of the biggest reasons I traded out the TM-16000 that I loved. The head of the stick is arranged in the typical US Air Force style, cloning but still giving a touch of futuristic element to three hats, pickle, and step buttons on top. This is a godsend if you're flying something like the F-16 where these hats are used for managing the avionics suite. On the TM-16000, I had to move over some of those functions to other controls, which in turn requires you to keep track of what, where, and how. The US Air Force adopted this model after a lot of research, because this is an intuitive approach, and SciTech, who originally made this stick, followed suit. Which, as previously mentioned, was one of my two reasons for buying this HOTAS in the first place. It isn't perfect though. The hats are too close together in the way the pickle button has been placed that your finger gets stuck if you try to go inside the hats. Meaning, you have to change your grip for this weird angle to thumb over everything to pickle. The Air Force also put a lot of testing into the different hats used, not only to help identify by feel which you're on, but to make sure when operating one, you don't operate the others. SciTech missed that memo, and Logitech never fixed it. You press one, you might press the others. It's also unfortunate that this is a single stage trigger, unlike the real US Air Force version. At this price point, I would have liked to have seen that included, but for many users, this will be a non-issue. However, you take those negatives and compare them against the positives, this is a fantastic stick. The hats are crisp, and while it's single stage, the trigger is crisp too, unlike the Air Force models which are mushy. The buttons have a clear break on press, and that made me a very happy user. As you run down the stick at the palm stop, again we see quality. The pinky switch is nice and big, very easy to use, but well built enough that you're not accidentally pressing it when you don't want to. The disconnect lever here is also exactly how I want it to be. Crisp, solid brake, and firm when not in use. Unfortunately from here, we see the biggest weakness of the X-56. First though, there is this adjustable rest, which by adjustable they mean you can remove it. It's a wasted opportunity for a useful part, as being truly adjustable is a feature some other lesser priced sticks offer. This is the real problem though. This is the strongest spring. This stick is looser than a, well, we're talking sticks and the innuendo is easy to come by, but for the sake of YouTube, center is an idea when it comes to the X-56, not a physical place where the sensors can read. SciTech aimed for a system that was easy for you, the user, to change out, swapping different springs in to change how stiff the stick tension is. It doesn't work. Stiff in this case needs to talk to its doctor. I'm terrified to even try putting the lesser springs on here. Take my word on stiffness being non-existent, but don't think the issue impacts you without putting some stock into it. For a general video game flight control, it's not that bad. Sure, some folks prefer a flaccid stick, I guess, but what I'm really talking about is when this shows up when gaming. If you're flying around in, say, Star Wars or Star Citizen, you probably won't notice. After all, if you're holding on and actually using the flight control, stiffness is simply a matter of preference. Even in DCS performing different air combat maneuvers, you don't really notice this. You pull the stick left and you bank left. This, this is where the problem really shows up. And if you're flying a flight simulator where finite and precise movements are critical, the inability of this stick to find center is going to drive you crazy. If you need precise tiny movements to do it, the X-56 will let you down every time. And that is because you will literally have to put in a small dead zone to cover the fact that the stick doesn't center. That means to perform finite adjustments, you have to move the stick further out than normal. And while the trigger is crisp, it's this ring that will really punish you, because this stick has two modes. Fine, when this ring is engaged, and the stick is just wobbling around inside the tension guard. And then loose, 
where the spring's no longer engaged and the stick has no tension at all. The intention behind this design was noble, but good intentions pave the road to a HOTAS that doesn't get used. This is one of two reasons that will probably have you looking forward to your next setup if you own one. Lastly, the base is massive. The only reason for this is apparently symmetry with the throttle. This makes it impossible to comfortably use this between your legs. Thankfully not an issue for me, primarily a Viper driver. Loose is a good place to be when we start talking about the throttle too. While the hats and buttons on the stick were crisp and firm, the team who designed the throttle were on an entirely different page. On the TM16000 review, I made the point that Thrustmaster's hats had clear direction when you pushed them. The X56 is the opposite. Maybe this is right. Maybe it's up. You don't know until the input's translated. I had originally used this hat for both my radio, up and down, and dogfight switch side to side. That ended after a single flight because even though I went up or down, half the time instead of talking over the radio, I put my bird into a snap air to air configuration. These are all way too close together. It's so hard not to hit one of these other hats while operating one of the others without looking at them. There's so little travel in these hats that your momentary bump trying to operate one of the others results in you sending commands from the other hat. It's enough of a problem generally that when I mapped these for controls in DCS, the top one was only used side to side, and the bottom hat pushed down only. That's three of eight inputs being used. What a waste. Once again on the X56 design, it was solid. The execution, horrible. The series of controls here in principle are awesome. Not only are these rotary dials that do read as axis inputs, but they're push buttons as well. You have this slider, which can be handy either as a modifier key or as Brock tipped me off, use it to turn the laser and a US fighter, normally the first stage of that trigger we were talking about. Unfortunately, this is poorly executed physically. These dials new out of the box make stick tension look like concrete. They do feature a center notch so you know when you brought it to center, but internally, the resistors are garbage, and if you set one of these to control zoom like I did, your zoom's gonna bounce back and forth constantly if you're not in the sweet spot that isn't the center notch. That means instead of using these for useful settings, they end up being used for pretty minor, less critical axis binds. That switch, well, the contacts aren't that great. You might have to switch it a few times to register, though that could also just be mine. Now, if you just use this wheel over here for visual zoom in your plans, this isn't an axis. Yes, it's a wheel, but instead it's mapped by Logitech as a switch, being two momentary buttons, one forward and one back. Stiffness does return though when it comes to this switch, which is damn near impossible to use without moving your grip on the throttle due to position and tension. Thankfully, however, there is a moment of good here, and that's the actual throttle. Even adjusting mine to the loose direction, the throttle arc is very stiff, making finite changes easy and enjoyable. This is one of the best feeling parts, the X56, because when you move the throttle, you feel like you really are pushing the throttle on something big like a 747. It feels expensive. And I know other users have reported over time it loosens, but in almost a year of flying where the throttle is always moving back and forth to maintain speed, mine is still enjoyably firm. Another win is both the fact that you have two separate throttle arms for left and right engines, and other uses we'll get into. Perhaps less important in DCS, but in other games where these are not always used for engine throttles, it's very easy to engage and disengage the lock that connects both for single throttle dual engine use. SciTech really nailed this, because even the real way modern fighters usually lock their throttles is much harder to use. The base is equally disappointing. They'll give you all these switches, which are great, and even throw these blocks in to help identify and prevent errant switching here, but looks can be deceiving. Every one of these switches is an on-off-on switch, but they're all momentary. At the end of the day, this decision is the most universal, but unfortunately prevents their use in DCS for some mappings. They wobble quite a bit fresh from the factory, and it only gets worse with time. They're also all identical, so don't think you'll use them without looking at the throttle to see which you're going to press. I did, however, find that while the throttle hats were useless, Due to the low position of the throttle, it was actually really easy to use these switches with my thumb, as long as the throttle was in the right part of the arc. Lastly, these two dials both center with notches and have left and right limits. The only problem with these is that there's two. I really could have used four in most cases, but 
two is more than the warthog has, so points in the positive here. Before we move into specific game use, a few other points to make. Both are set on their own USB cable, which is nice, allowing independent use of one or both. Unlike the TM16000, the stick only comes in a right-hand orientation. This means you can't use it as a host ass as a result. Logitech does include this mode knob. Well, waiting for this to arrive, I had big plans for it. Again, design, awesome. Execution, poor. Without getting super technical, in DCS, for example, you cannot use this switch as a modifier. There are some workarounds, but in general, every time you're going to want to use it as a modifier, you're going to have to switch this from one to the other and back. You can use it as a modifier if you do everything in the SciTech programming suite, which is very modern looking and offers a lot of functionality. It does take some learning to use, which is something I promptly didn't try to do. For that functionality, you have to change the profile in the suite for every game, and in the case of DCS, for every module. That's too cumbersome if you're flying more than one aircraft like I do. The loose stick irritates me, but you can get around that with practice. It only bites you when you try to do finite stuff, and after that it's simply a preference to have something with some real tension. That, however, isn't the reason that when this review ends, these are coming off these mounts. This HOTAS is power hungry and sensitive. It's probably the LEDs, but more likely just poor electrical engineering job running on discount boards. The X56 simply doesn't get enough electricity to run correctly from most USB ports. The result isn't sluggish performance, which might be bearable. No, the problem manifests itself in the opposite. Move the throttle arm forward and you might send five or six commands from various hats and switches on the throttle to your PC in addition. The mouse and stick hats will send continuous commands which result in movement you didn't command. For example, I use this mouse hat on the throttle as a radar slew, and while flying, my radar cue will just slew up and left constantly, changing my range and scan patterns as it does. To use the X56, you're pretty much going to have to install a PCIe USB hub, so that the USB ports powering the X56 draw their own power from the power supply, rather than share power with other motherboard components. You're going to need every tiny increment of power USB is rated to get, on paper, to deliver. Anything less, and these become worse than impossible to use. Most of you are savvy enough to put a graphics card in, so what's the problem grabbing up a PCI USB hub? Well, principally cost. Yes, you can buy them for around $35 from Amazon, and these will work for a month or two. Even then, you can only plug in the X56, so ignore all those other slots on the card. The design quality of these cards is garbage, and you risk borking your entire motherboard. Don't ask me how I know. One of these cards generated multiple BSODs. Never mind, these cheap ones are always single channel, so you risk compounding the multiple commands issue as the PC gets a signal from one device and thinks it might be the other. Hard over on the throttle Y axis might be full power to the engines, but for the stick, it's dive the pitch. So that means you'll need to really spend some money and grab one of these $100 to $200 versions. Now these are real PCI USB expansions, and each port is on its own channel and processor. So put a pin in that though, because this is where we should talk about all the reasons you should buy the X56. Price. The X56 in features is comparable to the $400 Warthog from Thrustmaster. You get a dual throttle for a little over half of that though. The X56 is a massive upgrade in inputs from its peers in the lower sub $200 HOTAS category, giving you options you don't see until the $400 and higher range. If you're flying a DCS module with more than a single engine, the X56 is the lowest level of HOTAS you should be considering. Yes, you can do the engine starts by key and then just use a single throttle like a normie, but let's face it, to truly hone your craft, you need to be able to adjust the engines in an emergency individually, or you could just fly an adult jet with only one engine. The value doesn't stop there outside of DCS. As we'll look at in the Star Citizen section, multiple throttle arms and the addition of all these buttons make this attractive in feature. Lower priced options just don't match these feature sets, spending a little more gets you with the X56 which unfortunately doesn't hold so true when you add in spending $200 on a proper PCIe USB hub. For that, you could have bought in the $400 segment, and there's certainly room to make the argument to save your money and do just that. Now, 
thousands of users can't all be wrong. The USB issue really rears its head for advanced flight sim gamers more than anything else. If you're using all the back USB ports and some on the front mounted ones too, expect issues. If the only USB devices on your machine are keyboard and mouse, the X56 may faithfully deliver. Likewise, there's a lot of other factors. If you spent $400 or more on your motherboard, you're probably not going to notice. If you spent less than $100, you almost certainly will. If you took shortcuts in your PC build, the X56 is going to know. I say this though, because it's very much an area I do stress considering the X56. If you're deciding between a premium HOTAS or a premium motherboard, put the money in your system. The X56 will be a faithful companion for you. The final line on the X56 is this. Compared to the PC HOTASs of the 1990s or even the 2000s, the X56 is worth the money. It was rolled out in the later part of that era, and its age is starting to show compared to more premium offerings of the current decade. Frankly, Logitech should reduce the price to sit more in the market segment below it, because at $250, the X56 only matches in price when you consider the bloated prices of high-end HOTAS units. Compared to units in the $150 range, it resembles them more in quality. If you are not a serious flight enthusiast demanding peak performance, the X56's flaws will likely be a nuisance and little more. For the vast majority of space gamers, arcade flyers, and so on, this stick has more than you'll ever need, and it would be hard to justify getting into the $400 Warthog segment. To the avid DCS flyers, Cap over at Grim Reapers uses a used X56. This review so far pretty much tells you all you need to know for DCS. The stick issue really shows its face when you need to do something finite like air-to-air -air refueling, but overall, it's been pretty good for DCS. It's tempting to say switch arrangement and styles are problematic to DCS because you really do need, in some cases, a switch that holds in one direction or the other, but this is the final offering before the high-end throttles that you might buy separately that will be effective for a large number of modules. Sliding into the Warthog throttle, for example, the switches are far better quality, and you get a smattering of momentary and non-momentary options. Yet, these end up being quite specialized for use, making their adaptation into something other than the A10 far harder and less useful. Buyer beware here that unless you start looking at Verpal throttles, for example, this is the last offering for universal arrangement. While the X56 cannot become a dual stick system, which is ideal for a lot of Star Citizen, combined with recent control changes, the X56 is a fairly decent setup for Star Citizen. The dual throttle really opened some possibilities here, and the biggest thing I enjoyed using this for was using the different throttles for both thrust and speed settings. This really let me do some fun things with landings. You'll have plenty of controls to map, and here the multiple on-off-on momentary switches are helpful, because you can map a switch to most functions and have an on and an off option to work from. The dual throttles can also be quite useful configured for mining operations, which I used it for for quite a bit when doing some Argo videos at the beginning of the year, while well, just sticking to the keyboard and mouse for flight control. Star Citizen also doesn't notice the stick issues as much because of the way the flight model works. So while I cannot wait to be rid of the X56 in my system, the truth of the matter is, if you're not looking for perfection, the X56 is a solid choice. For what you're paying, the build quality should be better. But for this degree of controls to map, you're going to have to pay a pretty penny for something equivalent. Star Citizen players shouldn't sweat the nuanced downsides of this system. Frankly, you should consider this the highest level of HOTAS to purchase. DCS flyers, on the other hand, should consider that finite control can be a problem, especially if you prefer a heavy stick. Still, this is a fantastic entry level for anyone flying a two-engine aircraft. Do you own an X-56? Let's talk about your experience in the comments below so that those who don't can read. As always, don't forget to like and share this video, subscribe if you haven't, and I will catch you all next time.